Hey everybody, welcome in. Garbage Time Sports, Joe Shad here tonight giving you your Saturday night week three college football recap. Guys, this was a great day for college football, but it was not a day for the casual college football fan. We didn't have a bunch of high profile matchups. We didn't have a bunch of big brands going at each other. We didn't have a lot of ranked on ranked games, especially no upper tier ranked on ranked games like number three in the country versus number nine. There wasn't any of that this weekend. But if you love college football, today was a beautiful day for you. It was a beautiful day for me. It had a little bit of everything that us as college football fans love. I'm going to run it down, give you all of my thoughts on everything that I got eyes on today. Didn't get eyes on everything, obviously. I'm just one guy, but this is what I saw today in some bigger picture thoughts that I have based on what I saw from week three today in the college football landscape. Going off the notepad, here we go. Starting with Friday night, let's go. Kansas State against Arizona. Guys, I had Arizona. I just love watching Arizona. I fell into that last year. Arizona always seemed to be the team that was on really late at night, so they were were always the last thing you watched going to bed. So I fell in love with McMillan. I fell in love with the quarterback Fafita last year. And I thought this year they would really have the chance to really build, even though their coach left and went to Washington. I thought Arizona could really be something this year, and really surprise people in their first year in the Big 12. But credit to K-State, that defense is legit. And let's talk a little Avery Johnson, highly recruited guy, Picks K-State's over a lot of different other schools. That guy could have gone pretty much anywhere. He comes to K-State. They get rid of Will Howard to clear the space for Avery Johnson to start. Will Howard, obviously, he is at Ohio State now. Johnson is really talented. He's really inexperienced. We all saw the situation at the half. Seven, eight seconds left. He gets to run a play. Runs around for too long. Doesn't get rid of the ball. Time expires, and K-State doesn't get a field goal at the end of the half. That's the lack of experience. That's the lack of playing time that he's shown. But he is really special. The arm is special. What he does with his legs is special. He rushed for over 100 yards, threw for two TDs. Passing yards weren't anything outstanding. They were like 170 or something like that. But he kind of has it, and you can see it. He's a true sophomore. He's still young. He's still learning. It's early in this season. This is his first season as a starter. He's going to get better and better. Watch out for him, especially next year. But K-State, they are in the driver's seat now to go win the Big 12. Cam Rising over at Utah. He's hurt. He might be done for the year, might not. The timetable's iffy on that. Utah and K-State were the top two teams in the Big 12 going into this year. It is solely K-State now. This is K-State's conference to to lose. The Big 12 is wide open for the other spot in the Big 12 championship game, for the other for the playoff spot. As long as you get into that championship game, you got a shot at the playoff. We'll talk about the Big 12 and how wide open that thing is later on when we talk about USCF and TCU. But yeah, I was really impressed with Kansas State. I was expecting Arizona to go out and be able to score on them. No, they can't. Kansas State is more physical than you would think. Their defense is really good, and Avery Johnson gives them a special element at quarterback. Kansas State, a lot of fun to watch, and they're officially the front runners in the Big 12. Let's go to big noon kickoff. Wisconsin hosting Alabama. Wisconsin had a really fun first drive. Tyler Van Dyke coming out here, started out hot. He was dealing. He was five for five on that first drive. He scrambled for a first down, and he got landed on wrong. Something happened to his knee, it looked like, and he goes out of the game, does not return. Haven't heard on how serious that injury is, but he definitely did not come back in this one. And since that point on, it was all Alabama. I think Wisconsin ended up with a field goal on that first drive, even though Van Dyke went out. They maybe got another first down there. But there wasn't much there for Wisconsin. It was all Alabama. Milrow is a special, special weapon at quarterback. He, I know he's not an NFL quarterback. I don't think he is. He doesn't love the intermediate stuff, but he's very good out in the flat, and he's very good throwing it deep. And combine that with his legs, and he is really hard to stop in the college football atmosphere. I have no complaints, no notes on the Alabama offense other than that. Kalen DeBoer is running it just fine on the offensive end. The defensive end, there are some worries there. There were some guys open that Wisconsin didn't hit. We saw it last week against UCF. I'd say there's some holes in the secondary. That was Nick Saban's specialty. 
when you think about it. He was very, very good at coaching up the secondary. Obviously, the entire defense, but especially the secondary. There are stories at the NFL level that you don't really want to draft Nick Saban secondary members because they've already reached their peak. They're not going to get a whole lot better because Nick Saban already coached them up and taught them so well. So kind of what you see is what you get with those Alabama corners. Kalen DeBoer probably does not have the same defensive mindset as Nick Saban. So it's not shocking that the defense takes a step back with Saban not being on the sideline. But Kalen DeBoer, really good coach. No complaints coming out of Alabama with them crushing Wisconsin in Camp Randall. The offense looked good. It was a fun first quarter, kind of, for Wisconsin, but that's it. Alabama rolls. Injury news of the day. Let's go over to Texas versus UTSA. Quinn Ewers goes out today with a strained abdomen. Haven't heard the timetable. It's not out yet at the time of this recording. But the reason that we here at Garbage Time Sports made Texas our official pick to win the SEC is simply because they could sustain an injury better than anybody else in the country, especially at the quarterback position. And Arch Manning came in and showed out. Yes, I know it's against UTSA, but there would be some sort of drop off if he wasn't that good from him to Quinn Ewers. If he wasn't as good as Quinn Ewers, there would be some drop-off there. He was 9 for 12. He threw for five touchdowns. He rushed for another one. Maybe it was five total, threw for four, rushed for one. Regardless, he was fantastic. I know it's against UTSA, but that's the reason that we liked picking Texas as the SEC champ. If Quinn Ewers goes down, they have a guy who can back him up. If Carson Beck goes down for Georgia... Do they have a guy behind him that can really come in and really keep Georgia afloat against the top tier of the SEC? People going crazy over Arch Manning having that 62-yard touchdown run, asking where is the athleticism coming from? Guys, it's coming not from Peyton Manning, not from Eli Manning. The athleticism is coming from his grandpa, Archie Manning. All right, you got to go all the way back there. He has the Manning athleticism like his grandfather did. Archie Manning was very athletic. So that was fun to see, fun to see people realize Arch Manning is going to be very good. Texas will be totally fine with Arch Manning at the helm, however long that takes. Quinn Ewers, better get back quick. I'm not calling for his job. Quinn Ewers has been nothing but outstanding this year and last year. But when a locker room turns, a locker room turns. And I wish Quinn Ewers all the best. They'll definitely go back to him, but if something happens when he comes back, everybody watch out. Let's go to probably the best game of the day. LSU going into the South Carolina Gamecocks' home stadium, and the Gamecocks gave them everything they got. South Carolina started up 17 to nothing on the LSU Tigers. But that wasn't quite enough cushion. LSU did get it rolling. The offense started clicking a little better. They started to crawl back into it. The defense turned on a little bit. And ultimately, I think you could just see that LSU had more guys than South Carolina did. The play of the game was South Carolina in the fourth quarter intercepts the ball in their own end zone and run it out to return it for a pick six that gets called back because of a QB head hunting penalty, unnecessary roughness. I remember when they put this rule in, you can't go head hunt the quarterback on an interception return on purpose. That's what they called. It was pretty bogus. I would say the QB was enough in the play. Probably unnecessary, sure, but at that point in the game, you hate to take that away from South Carolina. You hate to decide the game, which it did in the end. You hate to decide the game like that, but you live, you learn, and LSU lives to fight another day. South Carolina, the interception did count, but they didn't get the pick six off of it. South Carolina couldn't do anything with the ball. They have to punt it away. LSU comes right down the field and scores, and then South Carolina did have a field goal at the end of this game to tie it up at 36. It is missed, and once again, you can't trust a college kicker. You can't just go out there and trust that a college kicker is going to get it done for you. It's emotional as a fan. It's tough to see that happen in your home stadium, being up 17-0 and then losing 33-36. to You look around wondering what happened. I thought South Carolina's defense played really, really well, about as well as you could. The offense slowed down, was stagnant. South Carolina just doesn't have enough talent to get this done, but the opportunities were there. The mistakes were there for LSU. South Carolina just couldn't 
quite capitalize, and it's a real shame that the pick six came off the board. Would have loved to have a marquee upset, a marquee talking point of the day if South Carolina was able to finish that off. Everybody who took South Carolina to cover that spread, though, congratulations to you. I stayed away from it. I didn't want any part of it. I didn't know what was going to happen. On the LSU side of things, I would like to officially downgrade what we think of that USC win over the LSU Tigers. We came away from that game in Las Vegas thinking, wow, USC must be really good because they took down LSU. LSU is going to have a high firepower offense. The defense is going to be solid. That O-line is amazing. LSU is going to be outstanding. USC beating LSU, that's a really quality win, and that is something that really propels USC up into the college football playoff conversation. After watching today, after watching all the mistakes and the miscues that LSU had, both offensively and defensively, I just want to downgrade LSU. I don't think that's not as good of a win in my mind for USC as it was two weeks ago. LSU still has the chance to put it together and have a fantastic season, but right now, I don't see LSU as anything more than a middle-tier SEC team that's solid, has a lot of talent, but can't quite put it together. Brian Kelly needs to figure it out. It's just not quite there downgrading that win for USC. I'm downgrading LSU overall, ready to move them back up whenever they look like a more of a complete unit. But for right now, that's where I'm at with the LSU Tigers. Let's go to Boston College, Mizzou, which looked a lot like South Carolina and LSU. BC started out this game up 14 to three. Their quarterback Castellanos kind of looked like a mini version of Kyler Murray out there. Looked really good in the first quarter, first half. Then he kind of fell off a cliff. Mizzou's defense got to work as they do. Missouri's defense is outstanding. They're going to keep Missouri in a lot of games no matter who they face. And then the offense did just enough to get this one done. I think this final was 28 to 21. If I wrote that down right, I might have gotten that one. I know Missouri is number six in the country. I know Boston College is solid this year. I don't think Missouri's a real threat to win the SEC or to even get into the playoffs. And here's why. They don't have enough offense. That defense can keep you in a lot of games, but when they go up against a high-powered offense, they're just not going to be able to keep up. I know Boston College is solid, but today against Boston College, you can only put up 28 points at home. It's at home, too. It's not like they were going to Boston College on a red bandana day, right? It's They were at home, and they can only put up 28 points. They look stifled for the first quarter and a half of that game. Just took them a while to get going. I'm not going to trust Missouri to go up against Tennessee, go up against Ole Miss, up against Alabama, Texas, Georgia. I'm not sure off the top of my head who they play the rest of the year. I know they have a softer schedule, but I don't really trust Missouri in those huge spots against teams that have a real offense that they that can attack that defense, unlike Boston College or any other of the teams that they face on their schedule do. A couple of fun ones here, Oregon, Oregon State, and Washington, Washington State. You got the Civil War and the Apple Cup happening in week three, no longer happening on Thanksgiving. Thank you, conference realignment. I don't like that. I know that though, I know that they left and Oregon and Washington are in the Big Ten. Why can't that game still be played on Thanksgiving weekend? Why can't we keep the rivalry games on Thanksgiving weekend? That's a tradition unlike any other. That's a fantastic tradition of college football. Make the rivalry games the Saturday, the Friday after Thanksgiving. It's needed. It's wanted. Everybody loves it. Keep those games there. They shouldn't have to be played in week. Case in point, Clemson and South Carolina. End of the year. Every single year. But that being said, Oregon State or Washington State, one of those teams was winning this game. It ends up being Washington State taking down Washington. Oregon got back on track and took care of business today. They're looking more like a top team in the country that everybody thought they were, but they had not looked like it throughout the first two games of the season. Oregon looked good. Washington State takes down Washington, gets their revenge. Why'd you leave us? Why'd you leave us behind? The Pac-2 It's still there. Washington State over Washington. Really fun result. Let's go to the saddest story in college football. Florida State is dead. Florida State is 0-3. Florida State has no identity. Florida State doesn't know what it's doing, doesn't know where they're going. It's time to bring in all the young kids and start getting ready for next year. It's over. Them being snubbed from the college football playoff absolutely took the wind out of their sails. That Jordan Travis injury last year, 
destroyed the entire Florida State program for the next two years or so. They're now in a rebuild. DJ, you can't play. The offense is nothing. The defense is fine, but not good enough to make up for how bad the offense is. Really sad day for FSU fans. Really sad day for college football, really. Florida State was supposed to be a top 10 type team. Them, Miami, Clemson were all going to be really good. The three horse race for the ACC title. It was going to be a lot of fun to watch, but it just, it, it's just not meant to be. Florida State's just done this year. Bring in the young guys, start getting ready for 2020. 5 2026 start recruiting out of high school mike norvell the transfer portal thing it was cool last year it definitely worked but now it's time to actually build that program from the ground up you bought yourself some time go ahead and tear it down let's get that high school recruiting up and just a side point how is it that florida and florida state are both this bad most of the high school talent in the country is from texas and florida how is florida this bad UCF isn't this bad. UCF is a solid team. More on them in the sec, in a sec. Florida State, Florida, y'all have got to figure this out. Y'all have got to try to put some sort of rope around Florida somewhere and get yourself some real homegrown talent. Next one on the list, the backyard brawl was today. Guys, again, this was not a casuals day for college football, but if you love college football, you loved today. Pitt in West Virginia, Pitt ends up winning this one 38 to 34. It was a really fun game. It was back and forth all night. The Pitt crowd going nuts. There was a blocked punt touchdown. Crazy things happen in this rivalry game. Crazy things happen in college football all the time. It was a great game. It's just really sad that neither of these teams have been very good over the past several years to where this game isn't a bigger deal on the national stage, trying to play for something real, trying to get into a bowl game that's higher up than just a mediocre bowl, right? If this game really meant something on the national level, it would be way cooler and everybody would know how fun this rivalry is. But instead, this is just something between two schools that are under 50 miles apart. It's a really fun game every year, though. West Virginia and Pitt, I'm so glad it's back. They brought it back a few years ago after it went away. Eli Holston, nice game. 300 yards, three TDs for the Pitt quarterback. Played really clean. It was really nice from him. And he ends up getting the Pitt Panthers a win over the West Virginia Mountaineers. Pitt, now 3-0. and ACC wide open with Florida State kind of not there. Clemson, what are they? The only only real team that everybody agrees on is Miami in the ACC. Pitt, can they make a run at the ACC championship? Try to be Cinderella, try to get into the playoff? We'll see. Only Miami standing in their way. Miami and Clemson, if you still believe in Clemson. I don't know if I still believe in Clemson, but I probably believe in them to beat Pitt. But who knows? 3 0. Fast start. You got to look at it. It's got to. It's got to check your eye a little bit and be like, oh, 3-0. I, I will look. I will keep looking at Pitt. The UCF Golden Knights come back from 21 down to take down the TCU Horn Frog. Both of these quarterbacks played out of their mind. Hoover for TCU threw the ball 51 times, 400 yards, four touchdowns. Jefferson. 230 and three. Neither had a pick. Really nice games for both. You're watching this game and TCU goes up 21 points and I'm watching it. I'm just thinking, man, I don't think TCU is this much better than UCF. I bet this game's going to flip and it flipped and it flipped in a huge way. I wasn't expecting the comeback to come all the way, but I expected the ending score to be something close and it was close. UCF comes back to win 35-34. TCU brought out the true freshman kicker to try to kick a 57-yard field goal as a last dying breath to try to win this game and not be shamed for blowing a 21-point lead but he misses it right. It might have had the leg. It was very close to having enough distance, but he did miss it to the right, so it doesn't matter. UCF with a great win, and that Big 12 is so wide open. The Big 12 is so wide open. It was supposed to be Utah, and it was supposed to be Kansas State. We know this. Those two teams were the main two teams in the Big 12. But everybody knew that anything could happen in this league. And sure enough, Cam Rising goes down with an injury. We don't know when he's coming back. 
So that makes Utah very vulnerable. K-State looks good. They took down Arizona this weekend. K-State looks really good. Avery Johnson looks legit. But outside of K-State, it is so wide open. UCF, now 3-0, and got their first conference win. TCU, still alive, looked really good tonight. Didn't quite get it done, but TCU will be there. Iowa State beat Iowa. Iowa State absolutely could get into the Big 12 title and therefore the playoff. Everybody believes in Oklahoma State with one of the best offensive lines in the country and Ollie Gordon running. Ollie Gordon hasn't looked great so far this year, but we still expect him to have a good conference season, if you know what I mean. Mike Gundy, much better in conference than out of conference. I still kind of like Arizona. That Arizona K-State game, that wasn't a conference game. That was a pre-scheduled game before the merger, so that was out of conference. Arizona is still very much alive for the conference if they can figure out that offense and be as high-powered as they were last year. I bet I'm missing a team or two that somebody out there thinks can make a run to the Big 12 title out of all of those Big 12 teams. It's going to be a really fun league. It's something we have to watch now that Cam Rising goes down for Utah. Kansas State should be the favorite. They've looked the best so far, if you ask me. Yeah, they had a little bit of a scare against Tulane last week, but they grew from it. They recovered from it. They go out there and beat a much better team than Tulane, if you ask me. Arizona, handily, K-State's the front runner. Everybody else, good luck. Have fun. This is going to be so much fun to watch throughout the course of the season. I cannot wait. And guys, my last big point of the night, let's go to Georgia against Kentucky. This was a fun game, a defensive slugfest if you love defensive football. Everybody saw this game as the 6.30 ABC night game, and you're just like, man, I wish there was a better game on tonight. I wish there was a better game to end the slate. You know, you love having that big game at the end of the day. Kentucky, Georgia, that doesn't really get it done. Nobody thought this was going to be a good game. This was a good game. This was a fun, close game. Defense, if you love defensive football, that's what this is. Neither offense could do anything for the first half. Could Kentucky pull off the upset? I pull up that game. I turn off TCU UCF. Go over to Kentucky against Georgia for the second half. Have to pull up TCU and UCF on my phone because UCF's coming back. It's amazing. Oh, my gosh. But Kentucky almost got it done tonight. Georgia gets just enough offense. Kentucky couldn't get into the end zone, had four field goals tonight, nothing else. Georgia ultimately gets it done and avoids the upset. It would have led every single outlet going into tomorrow's NFL slate. Oh my gosh, Georgia goes down, Georgia goes down. What an amazing night. But guys, as I'm watching this game, it just kind of hit me that even if Georgia does go down tonight, it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything anymore because of the 12-team playoff. Georgia is still firmly in the playoff if they go down tonight. Looking at Georgia's schedule, Georgia could lose that one, could lose another one. They might even be able to lose another one, and they're still going to end up in the playoff with even rest as everybody else, and they're going to get more chances. The beauty of the BCS or the 14 playoff, whichever one you preferred, is every single game was an elimination game. And I think the 12-team playoff is going to be fun as heck to watch. The actual playoff is going to be fun. But I'm sitting there watching Kentucky and Georgia, and I'm thinking, wow, this would be amazing if Kentucky can get this done and can take down Georgia. That would be such a big accomplishment for Kentucky. But on the national level, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter. At least it doesn't matter yet. Georgia would have to get like its third loss on the year before that game really matters. Because Georgia at 10-2 and two is getting into the playoff. But in a four-team playoff, if they lose that game, oh my gosh, there is no margin for error for Georgia on a schedule that has them playing Bama, Texas, Ole Miss, and Tennessee. If Georgia had no margin for error playing against those four top 10 teams, that's must-watch television. But now... Georgia survives. It's a 12-team playoff. Georgia can go 2-2 two and two against those four teams and make the playoff. Can almost guarantee it. They can go 2-2 two and two in those four games, and they will enter into the playoffs just fine. No, they won't be at home, but nobody wants to face Georgia with rest, not having to play in an SEC championship game if they're 10-2 and two probably. Nobody wants, to, nobody wants to see Georgia. This 12-team playoffs give the great teams just a huge margin of error. And the only reason that three, four, five schools don't win every single year is because the margin of error is so small. We're giving Georgia, we're giving Ohio State, we're giving Texas now 
anybody else you want to throw in that conversation. We're giving all of those teams one, two, three chances to fail. And it's not going to matter in the grand scheme of things until we get into the playoffs. I didn't want to end the night on such a negative note. I don't like that. The 12-team playoffs is going to be awesome, but the week-to-week of college football is just a little bit depressing, if you ask me. The 12-team playoff is going to be awesome. I can't wait to watch. This is probably the last rant I'll do about how I kind of disagree with the 12-team playoff, but it just, I, I just needed to say it because this game, this game last year really was close to being gut-wrenching for Georgia where if Georgia lost this one, this was just going to be a refocus point. It was going to be, guys, we have a lot of work to do. Let's not lose focus. Let's not think about any other opponent. And it's still a wake-up call for Georgia. Don't get me wrong. But I think as we get down the stretch, there's going to be some games that wouldn't have mattered that are going to matter, trying to shuffle in that 10, 11, 12 seed in the playoff. But there's also going to be some games that should matter that don't matter down the stretch this year. But again, I didn't want to leave on a negative note. I'm not going to leave on a negative note. So to end it, guys, UNLV beat Kansas on Friday night. That was a lot of fun. UNLV, I think, is right now in the driver's seat to be the group of five team that goes into the playoffs. They have a high-powered offense. They're a lot of fun to watch. I know they beat Kansas, but it is a group of four team. Not a group of four team. It is a power four team. It is somebody legitimate who had some hopes going into this year. UNLV, with the win, they're in the driver's seat in the group of five. Boise State had the shot to go in and beat Oregon. That would have put them in the driver's seat. Give me UNLV right now. I think that would be a lot of fun. I think that'd be a really random draw, a really random team. I think that'd be a heck of a lot of fun. Texas State also had the chance to beat Arizona State this weekend. They don't get it done. UNLV's in the driver's seat for that group of five spot. That'd be a fun story. I'd love to see it. I think that'd be great. So those are all of my thoughts from the college football weekend. Hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Tell your friends for us. Uh, Can't wait to have you back. Can't wait for more college football. I really am excited about the college football season. I don't want that last rant to be a bummer on this season. It really is a fantastic season. I just got a little sad tonight. That's all. I just got a little sad. I felt like something was missing from that game, and I put my finger on it. I knew exactly what it was. But anyways, that's all I got for tonight. For all of us, for all of us here at Garbage Time Sports, Have a great night.